Hello, my name is Scott McFarland, and for the past 35 years, I've been a volunteer. For over a decade, I served as a director of community service and volunteerism for the states of Illinois and then Missouri. And now I work for a national nonprofit that places volunteers all over the country. I've had the wonderful chance to meet some amazing people who are working day in and day out to make this world a little better for all of us. Now I want to introduce some of them to you. Please join me as we explore this volunteer life. Hello and welcome to the first episode of This Volunteer Life. My name is Scott and I am so excited to have you join me on this journey of exploring service stories. I know some amazing people who are giving so much back to the world and I'm looking forward to meeting some new people along the way right with you. I can't wait to share these stories because I believe that we all have a role to play in making this world a little bit better for ourselves and for all of our kids. And to do that, we have to come together through volunteerism. And what better way to come together through volunteerism than to share some of the amazing experiences that we've had along the way. So I am looking forward to having you join me on this journey as we meet new people. And for the first episode, I am so very excited to introduce you to Mark Lindquist. Mark is a friend of mine who is, well, Mark's a renaissance man. He does just about everything. He is a big band singer. He is an avid volunteer. He is an Air Force vet. He is a business owner. He is a motivational speaker. And for the past quite a few months, he has been self-deploying to Ukraine to help them in their time of need. Right after the Russian invasion of that country, Mark decided to hop a plane and get to work. But I'll let Mark tell you his story. Enjoy. So, Mark, what we do uh, here first is just get folks to know who you are. So introduce yourself a little bit, but also, too, while you're doing that, tell me about your um, first volunteer experience that you remember. Right on. So Mark J. Lindquist is my name, United States Air Force veteran and also AmeriCorps alum. Uh, so been doing national service for a, a lot of my career and um, grew up in Ortonville, Minnesota, small town of 2000 people. And the very first volunteer experience that I can recall is uh, what we call the flood of 97. And so I would have been a sophomore in, in high school. There's lakes and rivers all over Minnesota. And in the spring, when the when the snow melts, the Red River of the North goes up to the Hudson Bay, flows past Fargo, North Dakota and Grand Forks up to Winnipeg and, and on north. And so, you know, since it's still frozen up there in Canada, when the, the thaw happens in America, every spring we get floods around here. That happened in 97 when I was a sophomore in high school. And uh, they let out a school and let all of us kids from the high school go up to the airport to sandbag. Well, I mean, I don't care who you are. If you're in high <laughs> school and they're going to let you out of school and go sandbag to help save the town, you get on your, you know, your uh, cold weather gear, your raincoat, and you go and you shovel sand. And so <laughs> that was really one of the first experiences that I remember where the community banded together, stopped what they were doing, and pitched in to serve one another. And I'll never forget standing, you know, waist deep in frozen water, passing sandbags from one neighbor to another. And that was really, that was, that was a pretty impactful or powerful moment in a young person's life to see what people could do when they decide to work together for a common cause. You know, nobody asked, how does this person vote? Where do they go to church? What do they believe? It was just our neighbor who needed help and people answered that call. And, um, you know, I've been using that moment in that project as inspiration for my life and direction for it. Uh, well, for coming on 25 years now, you had the flood of 97. I had the flood of 93 friend. I yeah. know the Mississippi, uh, all too well after the flood of 93. So I hear yeah. you there. 
Yeah, yeah. So, Mark, tell me a little bit about how you got to where you are now. You mentioned your AmeriCorps service. You mentioned the, you, uh, your military service. What, what gets you from being that sophomore kid in 97 shoveling sand yeah. to where you're chatting with me in your car as you've got a pile full of stuff in your back seat? Uh, you know, I think it was as a young person gets hooked on service. Well, first of all, as a young person gets exposed to service and volunteerism and the power that that brings, um, you know, it's been something that I've kind of been seeking, uh, I guess most of my adult life that, that, that feeling, I, I suppose you could call it a, you know, a high of sorts that you get when you get the chance to serve others. Right. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a business person as well. Uh, I've certainly done things that benefit me, my friends, my family, et cetera. But the thing that gives you most joy is when you do it for no pay, when you do it for, you know, no necessarily uh, thanks or recognition other than maybe it's just the right thing to do. Right. And so uh, the greatest moments of my life, I believe have been while I've been in service to others, be it AmeriCorps and inner city communities, being fight, fighting wildland fires for the National Park Service under the AmeriCorps umbrella, serving at the Pentagon in 9-11 in the days uh, following that tragedy there at Ground Zero at the Pentagon as an American Red Cross volunteer, serving in major dis disasters around the country. Those moments um, are really hard to, to, to match, right? And so every chance that I get, uh, when, when I'm able, I, you know, try to extend myself in service to others, like I learned back 25 years ago. And so that led to service in the military. And then when the war in Ukraine kicked off uh, this phase of it on February 24th, like I think a lot of global citizens, but a lot of Americans, you'd see the things on the news and you'd feel compelled to do something, right? To, to help your fellow human being in their time of need. And so I'm never married, no kids, uh, you know, like I said, run my own business. So I have some freedom and flexibility. So I decided to buy a plane ticket to Warsaw, Poland, uh, get my military gear together, walk across the border and see if I could go help people in their fight for freedom. And so I've been doing that for the last six months and all these things here. These are all winter supplies, you know, blankets and medical supplies that I'll bring over to Ukraine here in just a few days. Um, and so just honored to serve and, and, and contribute and help however I can. You know, Mark. You say that a lot of global citizens saw what was happening in Ukraine and wanted to step up. And, you know, a lot of people have a lot of people have donated money, donated um, uh, support in one way or another, put you, you know, Ukrainian flags in their front yards. But there's a difference between wanting to help and then deciding to put your life on hold, get on a plane, fly halfway across the country not even knowing if you could get in the country at the time, which I'm sure you'll talk to us about that because yeah. I've been following you on Facebook throughout this and seeing your, your interesting story here. But I mean, how, how does one, I don't care your background. I don't care how tied in with service you are. It takes a certain bit of crazy to decide I'm going to hop a plane. I'm yeah. going to fly to Poland and I'm going to try to get into a war zone. How does that happen, sir? <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, know, you, you, say, <laughs> you say it's a certain amount of crazy yeah i mean I, I i all of us western volunteers over there who have walked across the border into this war zone i think we do recognize that yeah it takes a certain brand a certain flair a certain sense of adventure um you know and risk tolerance to do something like we're doing um but i think the world is is run by people who take action right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people who don't just think about it, but decide, you know, if there's something that I can do one, some way I can contribute, you use your time, your energy, your talents, your efforts, and your, your, you know, the motivation that you find inside to, to do things in, you know, in service of others. And to me, it was always like the cause and the reason why we should support the Ukrainians in their efforts was so clear and there were so many parallels between the reason why I raised my right hand and enlisted in the United States Air Force in defense of freedom and in, in, in defense of the principles that our Constitution of the United States uh, uh, stands for. And I thought the same feeling that I got before I enlisted, the same feeling that I got before I signed my AmeriCorps paperwork, 
was the same feeling I got in February, March of, of 2022 uh, when I heard President Zelensky's call for a foreign legion. So foreign legion, international brigades of the Spanish Civil War, the 1930s, French foreign legion, in the 1830s. He made a call the Saturday after February 24th for foreign fighters, international legion to be formed. And, you know, thousands and thousands of, of veterans across the world answered that call. Um, and so as I was considering, you know, do I do I really buy a plane ticket? Do I really buy some some military gear, some deployment gear, a rucksack, boots, these kinds of things, armor, and walk across the border into a war zone? Like, is that something I'm really prepared to do? Well, I figured that if you're going to arm bus drivers and teachers and daycare workers in Kiev with AK-47s when the siege of Kiev was happening in March, if you're going to do that, Maybe somebody from the American military with the training that we're provided could help. And so, you know, that's that's why I believed I might be an individual who could do some unique good over there, having had American military training, certainly no combat experience on my military record. But we're the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen in the American military. And so what I've found is just the tenacity, the training, the mental um, uh, fortitude that you're you, is instilled in you, the values and and the dedication to service and the mission has been something that has allowed us to make some impact over there in Ukraine, where some civilians or NGOs that want to help in Ukraine may not have had that risk tolerance to go into the Donbass and go, you know, five to 10 miles away from the Russian enemy lines to go help. And so we do, you know, found a group of veterans over there randomly um, that were assembled, that we assembled over there in Ukraine to help one another, run logistics, run uh, supply lines out to the front lines. And so we have about 25 different volunteers that have, like I said, randomly assembled. Some of them we met in a hotel lobby. Some of them we met at you know, waiting for an Uber uh, at a restaurant or in an airport. And we just decided, hey, here's my WhatsApp number. Here's my Facebook. Let's keep in touch. And when you've got a load of supplies, you let me know. I'll see if I can help. And so there's people from eight different countries on our little team of volunteers, uh, all of us unpaid, just trying to do good. And, um, you know, by the by the end of this trip, when I get over there this time this weekend, we will have moved five million dollars worth of medical supplies into the country in the last six months. And so, you know, certainly we need more, but uh, that's a good start. So. Tell me a, a couple stories of those impact. I mean, th that number, that sheer number of 5 million is insane. But what does that mean for the individual person in Ukraine? What, what kind of experiences have you had dealing with individuals, families that are going through this experience and how those supplies, those connections are so needed? You know, what we deliver is non-lethal aid. Uh, medical supplies, things that will save the lives of individuals. And so it's things like bandages, you know, I've got in my bag right here, um, a, uh, this is a bag full of medical supplies, and I'll show you what we're so, delivering. So for those uh, listening to the audio version of this, um, and it can't see the video, this bag he's got is the size of a person <laughs> on the, on his Hockey passenger bag. seat. <laughs> You know, and these, these are just regular bandages that, that you know, you and I would take for granted if we saw in a first aid kit. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're delivering these types of items that on the shelf, Scott, it, I mean, these things might cost seven cents, right? Mm -hmm. a, 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 little, a little bandage of gauze. Mm -hmm. And I deliver these types of things, first aid kits, tourniquets. And specifically, I had made a delivery of about... Um, 3,000 of these types of bandages off to a military unit because we support those folks that are out fighting um, that get hit by shrapnel and missiles uh, and artillery and they need bandages to, to, to uh, stop the bleeding with their wound. It's a bandage that costs a few cents and cause the people that I delivered it to, the soldiers, to weep. Mm -hmm. Because they knew that what they had been doing was packing guys' wounds with dirt, mm -hmm. right? Ripping off sleeves of clothing to pack it with cloth, you know, that certainly is contaminated, that certainly isn't sterile. And they know that this is something that can save their buddy's life. And when you try to stand up a, a, a million-man army, 
on private donations. These are the types of things that matter. And so I can't tell you how many hugs and handshakes and mm -hmm. tears that, that, that I have experienced. I wish that my donors would be able to have that same experience. When you deliver something as simple and as seemingly inconsequential as a bandage to them. But then the days that you are able to deliver body armor, you know, that costs a thousand dollars, you know, level four, that should sh stop shrapnel, ballistic helmets, um, you know, drones for surveillance, uh, um, you know, so that they can get people in and out, you know, during the humanitarian green zone evacuations. These types of things, when you deliver them to the hands of a Ukrainian who makes $200 US a month, mm. that's what they make out in the Donbass. And your brother, your uncle, your cousin, your father gets deployed to the front lines in a trench in the Donbass. And they're getting sent out there with hoodies and baseball caps. And you come and deliver US hospital grade medical supply. You deliver US military grade body armor. That it's like you showed up with with oxygen for someone who can't breathe hmm. because they know that without these things, without these supplies that do exist on planet Earth, the world has enough of this stuff. It's just in the wrong place. And when you show up with a van unexpected and say, here's a donation for your guys out fighting or here's a donation for your local village's family who has fled a war zone, the gratitude that you hear and feel and the uh, appreciation that is expressed to you as an American over there doing this work, it's, it's something that I really wish that everybody who volunteers and, and, and you know, uh, gives of their time, treasure, energy, and efforts to do these things for anybody, be it someone in your own community or, or in, in a war zone. I wish that people could have that experience because what I believe it'll do is it will inspire that person to serve more and, and do that again. Because how can you, after having that experience, serving others, you know, drying tears from your shoulder from the mother who is going to deliver this to their frontline soldier the next day, how can you not want to use your life to serve people like this again and again and again? So that's why I'm headed back over to Ukraine this weekend and uh, we'll deliver these medical supplies to folks that are really having to use things from around the room or around their home uh, to try to save lives when they really should have, you know, hospital grade materials. Um, and so it's just been, you know, just been a very necessary um, bit of work that we're doing uh, for folks that deserve freedom uh, just as much as you and I. So <clears throat> you've mentioned, you know, the high that is service. You've mentioned that once somebody volunteers once, they're probably going to volunteer again, which is something that we see in research throughout. So tell me of some of the donors and supporters stateside that you've worked with. I know you, uh, you came back um, over the summer and you did your, your concert, which by the way, you are a singer, um, which again, I, I, I don't know what you aren't, sir, but um, <laughs> we'll just continue to make the list of what you are. But you, you, I know you were spending most of um, this past month, you know, knocking on doors, trying to get support. So talk to me a little bit about what support you're seeing, both at an individual level, but also at that higher level. I know you've met some, some movers and shakers. Uh, so talk about what you're seeing in terms of that support. It's an overwhelming outpouring of support. Um, but of course, we can use more, right? Um, so really it's just, when I started this, I said, well, how do I raise money? You know, I'm not a professional fundraiser, you know, I, I, I do good or certainly, but I don't have a professional fundraising apparatus. I didn't have a 501 C three at the time. Uh, I was just a guy that wanted to help. So of course you start a GoFundMe. And so really it's largely been me and my friends, uh, and folks within our circle, just donating $25 at a time, 50 bucks at a time. You know, I always tell people $10 gets me a tourniquet that I can source locally in Ukraine and I can probably save a guy's life with it. And so it does matter. I've got friends that every time they go get a Starbucks coffee, they send me the equivalent amount on Venmo and, and that's their contribution and they're not forgetting, right? And that's, that's five bucks at a time. That's seven bucks at a time. And I love it. And so right around a thousand different donors uh, over the course of the past six months since I announced my trip over there, uh, we've raised about $185,000. 
um, on an individual basis. We haven't gotten any, um, you know, major corporate donations. I just didn't have time to work the phones like that while I was over there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just been individual citizens, a few bucks at a time, uh, contributing to this thing. You know, because I can get a pallet of medical supplies over there worth forty-two thousand dollars if you give me four hundred dollars. I can I can get it over there. And so I think a lot of people they didn't know how to help, right? Yeah, they wanted to help, but they didn't necessarily. They don't want their money going to some Russian oligarch. They don't want it going to some you know organization that isn't going to use the money and resources to actually help. And so once my friends knew that I was going to be over there to hand deliver these things, they showed up uh, in mass. Now, uh, I'll speak a moment about the tens of thousands, I mean, tens of thousands of Western volunteers that were over in Poland and Ukraine in March and April, having responded to the news stories that we all saw on our phones. And they were over there crawling around the region, helping just like we were, delivering supplies, bringing donations over one suitcase at a time on a commercial plane, because that's the fastest way to get things over there. And so we would deliver these things. and. Um, you know, now I think that the next phase of our impact is I'll probably start spending some more time over here in, in America, drumming up support, doing speaking engagements, doing big band charity benefit concerts, trying to get people uh, re-engaged in this, this uh, uh, humanitarian mission. And so, um, you know, it, it's got to be corporate sponsorships. It's got to be five and six figure checks. It's got to be, uh, you know, a, a reinvigoration of America's care for this issue now that we're eight months past the initial, you know, uh, invasion, because you know how it is. Our, our attention pan, spans are short and, you know, we're on to the next thing and we're inundated with the, 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 the news of the day. But I would just encourage people to use their networks and use the people that are of influence at your church, at your, your Kiwanis and Lions and Rotary Club and in your local group of neighbors to say, you know what? There's a guy over there, U.S. veteran, who's helping, continuing to help, is long-term committed to this mission that if you just got us $10, we could save a guy's life over there with a tourniquet. And I've got a group of college friends that I haven't talked to or seen for 22 years that I got on a Zoom with. We did a 45 minute, you know, Q&A about Ukraine. And these six women, all neighbors in Minnesota, sent me $3,000 hmm. a week because they just started telling their friends that they could help. Right. And so if you have a heart to help the people of Ukraine that are in desperate need of American support, there is a way to do it. And I know there's a lot of causes that people could get involved in these days and wonderful work that's being done in communities. It is my opinion that there is no more important thing on planet Earth happening today than this attack on freedom for those that live in a land just as free as you and I in America. In fact, Scott, I may even say that in Ukraine, there's more freedom that people enjoy there than in the United States of America, because if you think about it, their independence was declared 30 years ago, 31, you know, in 1991, when the Soviet Union broke up. And so their rule book, their laws of the land, it's only 30 years thick, right? as they're trying to figure out how to run a democracy and run a free society following the Western ways. Ours is 241 years thick. There's all kinds of laws and rules and things you can't do in America because somebody messed it up, you know, back 30 years ago and they made a law that says you can't do those things anymore. And so not to say that Ukraine is lawless, but it is to say they enjoy the same freedom and uh, lifestyle and Western life. They go to work. They the, you know, there's Wi-Fi all over the country. I can get an Airbnb on my phone. I can use Uber. I can use Uber Eats. It's as Western and as free a life as you and I know. It's just that they're on a different spot on planet Earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just continue to say to people that of all the things you could give your attention to in 2022, that this is as worthy a cause to support freedom on planet Earth it's as worthy a cause as anything that you could get involved in these days. And so I, you know, I hope people, uh, um, you know, can continue to, uh, to care about the people, um, who are, uh, you know, undeserving of being attacked by missiles and undeserving of being 
uh, uh, you know, seeing their neighbors get hit by shrapnel from a, you know, from a weapon sent by Russia. Um, so we'll continue to do the work. Yeah. I think it's extremely important what you're saying to in terms of our attention span. Yes, this has been going on for eight months now, but just this week, it has continued to intensify the fighting. Um, Russia has annexed or claimed to annex several parts of the country. Uh, it seems like in terms of the war of attrition, Ukraine is doing very well, but it's a war of attrition. So they're going to be doing it for years, unfortunately, unless something changes. So how do we as a culture, so I wouldn't even say Americans, but as a culture across this, this world, how do we stay in this for the long haul? Because this is not going to end in the next few months. Yeah. <clears throat> My assessment is that we must call upon the same spirit that the greatest generation 80 years ago did and respond in the same way that our grandparents did during another similar global conflict on this continent, European continent, 80 years ago. Because it, it proves to me, when you recall the lessons of the greatest generation, it reminds me it's in us, right? It's in our ability and spirit as a free society uh, for Americans to in mass care about this cause of freedom like our grandparents did. One thing that I don't know if people understand about World War II and about how the, the, that generation of Americans did respond is 41% of the bill that we needed to pay for World War II, 41% came from tax revenue. 59% came from war bonds. It came from Americans deciding to save and buy these war bonds to contribute so the government had enough money to build bombs and planes. And so there is an almost two thirds responsibility on the shoulders of the individual citizens to band together and act in the way that our grandparents would be proud of. Because it is my opinion that if grandma and grandpa were to sit us down, all of us collectively as American society, I think they'd give us a talking to, right? No doubt, I, no doubt. Right? I, they would say, what are you doing? As distracted as you are when something like this is being repeated on the European continent. We know how this movie ends. We've seen it before. I was standing on the platform at Auschwitz a month ago. I left Ukraine. I was doing some writing, some reflecting on how we could make our impact. And I decided to go to, to, to um, Southern Poland and go to Auschwitz because I realized the same tragedies, the same things that are being that we heard of 80 years ago at Auschwitz, at Dachau, and at the concentration camps. It's happening, albeit on a smaller scale. Those things are happening in Ukraine right now. There are concentration camps. There are liberation camps where people are being tortured. There are women and children being raped and in front of their family members. There are the, the most horrible things happening that you can remember from your study of the Holocaust. It's happening again. And for the ambassadors of freedom, for those who enjoy the fruits of freedom, to sit idly by during this time on planet Earth, where the second largest military on the planet, run by a madman, is trying to obliterate European cities, move in and then call that town Russia. I, 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 I'm appalled at the idea that we as Westerners and Americans could sit by and not do everything that we can to support these people and stop this aggression. Now, I, I know that we're all afraid of nuclear war. I know that we're all afraid of what Putin might do because we don't know necessarily his appetite for using tactical nukes. I wasn't alive in the 40s, but from my study of history, I think I can confidently say this. We didn't necessarily know Germany's progress with the bomb in the 40s, but yet we still had the guts and the fortitude to engage and say this cannot happen on planet Earth because this is freedom's territory. And 
if you go to Eastern Ukraine and you come with me to Kramatorsk and you come with me 10 miles away from the Russian enemy lines, they live life there as free as you and I. And for us to allow Russia to claim that city as now a Russian city, move in and then run the, that area like is, it is Russia. How can we let that happen? That's, that's something that I think we, if I were in charge or, you know, president or king for a day, I would push the needle a little further and say, on principle, as defenders of freedom, as a man who has signed up and decided to put his life on the line as 20 million American veterans have done in the American military, saying that these principles that our constitution stands for should be available to all citizens of the world. You know, what does it say? It says that human beings have inalienable rights. And it doesn't say just people inside the United States of America have inalienable rights, that they are referring to mankind. And if you do truly believe that, then it is necessary for you to take action if you do believe that all citizens of Earth should have these rights and benefits. Because right now, there are about 15 million people that are being denied those rights, that are being denied the ability to live in their own homes and pursue their own lifestyle. And really, 44 million people in the entirety of the country of Ukraine, who, for them, the possibility of living a free and independent and Western life is being extinguished one missile at a time. You, you refer to World War II, and I agree with you. I think the greatest generation would have some words for us, and I'm sure some of them have who are still with us. But I would argue we actually even have it easier to have an impact now than we did back in yes. 41 or yes. even the late 30s because we've got the ability, like, Mark, you've got to go fund me. They didn't have GoFundMes back in the 1940s. Right. You mentioned being able to ship over supplies one luggage uh, piece at a time on commercial airlines. And I know yes. you've, you've seen, uh, I've seen on your Facebook that uh, some commercial airlines have allowed you to fly your uh, luggage free instead of having yes. to charge for it. So there are ways to have an impact that our great grandparents could not have aside from buying those bonds or going to work or being, you know, obviously serving. So as easy as it is to volunteer and to serve now from your, from the comfort of your couch in your living room, how do we get more people involved, not just in Ukraine and that support, but how do we get people involved in the issues happening down the street from their house when they have so many opportunities to volunteer? But right now we know that only about one in three people do. Sure. <sighs> If you want to, you know, go 30,000 foot view and, you know, how do we do this as a society? You know, my, my advice would be, if it's only one in three that volunteers now, we have to work on those other two thirds. We have to work on those individuals, getting them involved in direct service, because like we had started the conversation, I'm of the opinion, if you involve people in direct service and service to your, your, your fellow human, that is addicting, right? And so the only way to get, you know, more volunteers is to create more volunteers and more volunteer opportunities so that people can get hooked on service, right? So that's number one. Number two, I think with the use of technology that exists today, I think there needs to be a, a, a pause or a moment of awareness that although we take these technologies and smartphones and connectivity for granted, we do have to realize that this allows society, global society, a really new opportunity in the last, well, when, when did the iPhone come out? 2008. So, to the, you know, 14 years. In the last 14 years, we've been given and been empowered with this technology to help people on the other side of the planet like we've never done before. It used to be when you and I were growing up, if you wanted to help kids in Africa, your only option really was Sally Struthers and, you know, five cents a day, right? <laughs> yeah. Today... I could give you the WhatsApp phone number 
of Ukrainian soldiers and volunteers in Ukraine, and you could get on a video chat with them today, and you could I could get a translator for you. Most of them speak English, and they could tell you an address to send items to, what is needed today that wasn't needed yesterday, and you could connect with them almost instantaneously, right? You can see frontline footage from the battlefield on Telegram and Instagram, right? You can know about these conflicts and the need instantaneously 5,000 miles away. That wasn't the case 80 years ago. You had to wait for the newspaper to come out the next day to find out what was going on. These days, there is, there is, there's almost a ubiquitous and unlimited ability for people to engage and find ways to help if they just asked, right? And I think we need to recondition ourselves. We need to re recondition ourselves when these types of things happen on planet Earth now that we live in the technological age, because now warfare has moved into modern societies. Americans are conditioned by 20 years of war happening in third world countries, right? In Iraq and Afghanistan in the Middle East. And now it is being visited upon people who live no different than if you were in Springfield, Missouri, or if you're in Peoria, Illinois, or Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so with that increased technology and connectivity, there's a great opportunity for people to help folks in need with the wealth of America um, and do it very rapidly. If like, for example, this, you know, we're referring to the bag of bandages that I have in my car right now that I'm bringing over there. I picked that up yesterday and by Tuesday, it'll be in the hands of a Ukrainian on the other side of the planet who will be able to use those things in their first aid kit next week. Right. And like you say, that's a unique opportunity on planet Earth for people to be able to make that kind of impact. Think about it. There's a movie, I think, coming out on Netflix about the great, the greatest beer run ever. Have you seen that? Uh, I've seen the commercials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so think about that. Back, what was that? You know, uh, what we're talking fifty years ago. You know, th they did something so amazing that they brought beer to guys in Vietnam, and they, it was so significant they're making a movie about it, <laughs> right? And so that's what we're doing, and and thousands of us Western volunteers are doing every day, because it's just so much simpler these days to be able to walk into a war zone and help. And so it is pretty miraculous how things have changed and, and can change, have changed so that people can help at a greater level. And I think it's inspiring. So you and I are somewhat the same age. I think we're about a year apart. So I will say this and it hurts me to say it, but we're getting to that point of about middle age. So <laughs> oh, middle age. Oh, no, you can't say I know, that. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, I know it, it's painful to say. Where do you want to go from here, Mark? I mean, I mean, dude, you've done more than most people would have on a bucket list four pages long. But I know you had plans before your self-deployment. I know you've got plans after. Where does this service life going to take you? Where do you think you'll see yourself, you know, 30, 40 years from now looking back and saying, okay, this is what I was able to accomplish. What are some things that you want to be able to say that you haven't been able to do yet? Well, um, it's much like we've been talking about. Once you serve in a certain way and impact people, you kind of get hooked on it. And now, now, yeah, I've never done this in a war zone before. I've, I've never even gone to Haiti after the, the, the earthquakes or, or tsunamis. I certainly have helped after natural disasters like hurricanes. But I've never, I never, I didn't go back to Afghanistan after I was deployed there with the military to help the citizens. I didn't go to Iraq. I didn't go to Syria or, or any of these other places on earth that need help. This has now made me realize that, well, maybe I do have a skill set and a tenacity and an ability to help in situations like this. And for now, for the next, well, at least six months to maybe a couple of years, as long as Ukraine needs help, I'll be doing this, right? Because it's something I'm passionate about. Following the war in Ukraine, um, us all hoping that it ends soon and we can get to the rebuild, you know, I'll continue to do what I always do is, you know, I'm a public speaker and I kind of, us public speakers and motivational speakers, we fancy ourselves as Mark Twain figures, right? Think about what Mark Twain would do. Mark Twain was an adventurer. He'd go off and have, a, you know, some, some tale. And then, then he, would, he would stop in your town and stand, you know, 
in front of the townspeople and retell the story. And it would, you know, he people maybe not, maybe they don't realize that although he was a great writer, he was also a great orator, right? And storyteller. And so that's what I do. And that's what I will do, especially with these stories from uh, Ukraine, is stop it once in a while at a local church, local Kiwanis Lions and Rotary Club, Chamber of Commerce, or neighborhood house party. And I'll tell these stories one audience at a time. And I think that's my, you know, maybe my skill set or my gift. It's what I do for a living and professionally. So certainly with this, I hope to do the same. You know, spend the next, well, you said we're middle aged, so I don't know how many years we got. Six uh, decades, right? Hopefully Seven, well, there's but, some medical advancements coming. We can get a little longer out of this, but you know, yeah, you know. Let's let's squeeze eight decades out of this thing, right? I'm all for it. You know, let's do the let let's compel people to the power of story and to the power of narrative and the power of connection to be able to uh, inspire people to serve and do more for others with their excess. Uh, and I'm sure that I will do that uh, on lecture tours and speaking tours and big band concerts, etc. But I don't know. I mean, I'm 41 years old. You know, I suppose that this is the time that we should be experiencing some sort of midlife crisis, right? And try to figure out what life is all about. And for me, I think can safely uh, uh, say it's got to have something to do with serving others. It's mm. something that I enjoy. It's something I'm situated to do. Um, what that might look like in the future, who knows? Um, I, I think largely inspiring groups of citizens, small groups is what does Margaret Mead say? You know, the small groups, uh, thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Um, you know, if it's one small group at a time, great. If somehow we can figure out how to inspire a nation, much like the greatest generation, uh, and our response, great. But at least we will start. And uh, when I get back this next trip in 10 days, uh, that work will begin. Um, so coming to a community center near you with old blue haired ladies, you know, from the local church, baking pies and, 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 you know, sewing quilts for the Ukrainians, we will do that work uh, one audience at a time, just like you and I met, Scott. Well, and you know, I think you hit the nail on the head with saying that we need more storytellers. The one thing that good old Mark Twain didn't have back, you know, 150 years ago is the ability for all of us to tell that story. The ability for all of us through social media, through our networks to tell that story. And I think that at the end of the day, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this is as you're pointed out, we need to ask people to join us in these efforts, whatever these efforts are. Yeah. So I think we all need to do a better job. Maybe not so much you, Mark, you're pretty damn good at it, but we all need to do a better job of talking up what this service means to us, regardless of what that is. Yeah. And I think that's going to change things for the better. If we all yeah. go out to somebody else and say, Hey, I am doing this and it means something. Will you join me in doing this? Yeah, I, that is what we need to do a better job of. So, Mark, before we wind up with this, um, anything else that you want to talk about, anything you want to add or any kind of selfish plugs you like to throw in there? And also, I will put in the show notes uh, a link to your GoFundMe, to your Facebook, uh, so you. folks can follow you as well there. So uh, hopefully folks listening to this will support Mark in these efforts. Again, the GoFundMe is out there. And as he said, they've raised nearly $200,000, but it's been donations, probably less than 150 bucks a piece. So yeah. it's not that hard to make this work and to help keep this going. But Mark, anything else you want to add? You know, I think from this last week of me being here in America, fundraising, rallying support, collecting supplies, I think the example I'd like to leave people with is... I went down to my hometown, Ortonville, Minnesota, that same town that flooded, you know, some 15, well, no, oh gosh, 20, math is hard, 25 years ago. Um, so I went down to Ortonville and some folks back there had been doing some fundraisers for me. And uh, the local church that I belonged to, that I grew up in, uh, spread the word to other local churches. And then the local AMVETs, um, you know, we got together as well. 
And in the course of two different meetings, I collected $9,000 from their efforts from a community of 2,000 people, right? And you think about what impact that might make for a cause like this. I just did the quick math here. That means we can get probably two more shipping containers if I can get them out of New York. And that's $1.76 million worth of medical supplies that our little community sponsored this week. And it was a pancake dinner and, you know, a, an advertisement in the newspaper that you could send a check, right? And how, how beautiful is that? You know, that, that folks from a small town in Western Minnesota that is 5,000 miles away from the war zone that we're serving in can now bring $1.7 million worth of medical supplies to those people and help save a Ukrainian's life. Um, it can be done. It can be done in small, tiny little events in your network. And I, I do believe that individuals listening to this have much greater ability to make an impact than they even know today. Um, and like you said, you nailed it. All it takes is for people who care about causes to ask and make the ask of people in your network to help. And I know that Americans will. That's the, that's the key there. N having faith in our fellows that we are going to step up and do the right thing. And I, I agree with you. I'm, even in the darkest of times when we feel that things just aren't going right at all, regardless of your opinions on anything, looking at those who are stepping up, looking at those who are volunteering, it really does show that our best days are ahead of us. Yeah. Well, Mark, I really do appreciate it, buddy. I know you've got a lot going on. Uh, you're going to be bouncing around the world again. But um, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time out to chat with me. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll put the links in the show notes. So please, whoever is listening to this, watching this, go help Mark in his, his efforts. Go help the efforts of so many volunteers out there. And if you, um, if you can't help in monetary fashion, as Mark said, bake some pies, do something to help because uh, I agree. The, this is the issue of a generation. And if we do not support these folks now, uh, it won't be long before we'll be asking for support from other people. And so we need to get this done. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Mark, uh, you stay safe. I've seen some of the videos you post, and uh, you stay safe, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yep, have a good one, and hopefully we can chat. Thank you for listening to this Volunteer Life. Please be sure to like, subscribe, follow, and leave a review. You can visit thisvolunteerlife.com to find all our social media accounts, find all the volunteer stories, submit your volunteer story, and find a volunteer opportunity in your neck of the woods. The opening and closing theme was Fighter by OG's Not Again, available on Bixabay. Thank you, and we'll talk soon.